physicalize your voice. You know, there's a difference between good morning and good morning. How you doing? You know, whatever. I remember there was this kid came in on Treasure Planet and they were apologizing because he had a uh, he had a cold. That is gold. You know, I'm sitting there with the animator and I, and I said, I said, it is now an elephant and the elephant has a large nose and every time he sneezes, yeah, every time he sneezes, the thing contracts and whatever. And he's like, oh, what? and he starts drawing and I'm, I start rewriting and I'm like, I'm like, okay, say this. Welcome, welcome, Rob Edwards to my podcast, Diary of an Actress. I'm overjoyed to see you. Let's just talk about the elephant in the room. Look at that sign behind you. Yep. Where did you, yep. where, tell us more. We're in another one and we're gonna be here for a little while. Uh, yeah, no, it's, it's, it is very interesting to me because every time, hi everybody, I'm Rob Edwards. I, <laughs> I wrote yeah. uh, Princess and the Frog and I wrote, uh, uh, um, uh, Treasure Planet, I worked on Tangled and Frozen and Wreck-It Ralph, and before that I did uh, uh, Fresh Prince and Full House and uh, a whole bunch of fun, fun, fun stuff um, in Living Color. Anyway, the... Uh, oh my uh, god, uh, I want to cry, okay. So, so I've been through a million strikes, and I, I'll, I'll, I'm just using that to, to say, I've been through a million strikes, and it is always hilarious to me because, you know, since the dawn of time, it's, it's always been like... Oh, well, you know, we've moved from movies to TV. So, uh, oh, we don't make any money in TV. So I guess, we, you know, we can't pay the writers. And then we move from uh, from TV to uh, to cable. And, oh, we don't make any money on that. And then we move from, you know, that to, uh, you know, to streaming. And, oh, we don't make any money and we can't pay the writers. Eventually, you know, whatever, we'll be playing them on our eyelids and whatever. And they'll be the same arguments. But the the, the bottom line is always that, you charge people to watch these movies. So there is a there is a pile of money there somewhere. There's 19 billion dollars that they that they went to their uh, investors and said like, "Oh, what a great year we've been having because we don't have to print movies, we don't have to pay the the theaters, we don't have to do all this stuff. It's 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 uh, streamlined now. It's straight up money and uh, and at the same time they say, "Well, you know, there's no money for the writers and or the actors or the directors, and uh, and so we're not going to cut anybody in. It's just not fair. So you know we're going to be in here for a little while, and strikes are war. So it's going to be um, until everybody feels a lot of pain, unfortunately. Oh yeah, oh yeah. I uh, my picket is uh, 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 Fox because they're uh, I live in Beverly Hills, so it's 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 uh, I can basically walk to it. Uh, and what's hilarious. Actually, the the thing nobody talks about is writers. We all work in our little offices, and we kind of think and we do our things, and we don't get out very much. <laughs> you know, we don't air ourselves out, and so the picket line is this chance to kind of catch up with everybody that you've worked with. There's if you worked in TV at all, um, all the writers from all the shows that you've worked on are there. A bunch of guys that I've worked with in, in um, various movie projects and, and, and everything. So it's old home week. It's like a, a little dog run for uh, for writers. And uh, it, it's it's so much fun, uh, you know, just kind of getting getting uh, in touch with old uh, with with people that I've known for a million years. That's unbelievable. I mean, it's like a schmooze. It's a you know, the way I feel is that unions i mean we're all no matter what union you're in if you're in entertainment or not you're standing up against corporate greed you're standing up for the rights of others and that is something in our society that we need to do as a whole and so the fact that it's starting here in hollywood i hope that that point of view spreads right because there's so many greedy corporations around the world yeah exactly I mean that that um, you know that, that if they could make things for free and charge people and uh, make make their money, then then that's probably the perfect business model for them. Unfortunately, there's the inconvenience of of actors and directors and writers uh, who have to kind of come up with things that people actually want to watch. Uh, uh, you know, but it, it has been. I was astounded actually that the first thing that came up, the first big thing that came up, was AI. Uh, because, and as I talked to producers and writers, I was stunned at the amount of people who had already been handed AI scripts and asked to uh, rework them. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, that 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 they're and and AI scripts. If you've ever seen one, they are hilarious. They are they are so uh, formulaic and and just uh, you know uh, all the dialogue is on the money is 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 right on the nose. Um, they are. I mean, they'll get better, obviously, but but they're right now they're just horrendous. And AI has been exempted from uh, plagiarism rules. So whatever it is that you're reading, chances are it's appeared in a million films before because AI is not creative. It just aggregates everything that's already been done and uh, you know takes that and says, okay, well, these six movies are successful, so it should be, you know, this movie should be like this. I imagine that at, uh, uh, at a certain point, all the AI is going to just be uh, repetitive. It's going to just start cannibalizing other AI. Um, yeah, but it's 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 out there. It's free, so you know it's it's free writing, and uh, you know so so you can you can assume that most producers are are really excited about that. But it's um it's part of the conversation. It's it's um. The conversation has been had a lot. I don't personally know any writers who've, who've had to deal with it. I know that just in my personal experience, uh, I'll go to producers and producers will say, hey, we had this writer come in and he pitched this idea. They'll pitch me the idea that they had. And they'll say, well, we're not going to buy it from him, but we want you to see what you can do with it. I'm like, well, wait, if you're going to buy the idea, the idea should be, that's, that's that person's property. That person has taken a long time, you know, nervously coming up with this idea for this producer that they're hoping will, you know, re respect them enough to to either buy the idea or don't. But um, but the notion that they would just take an idea that that somebody else had come up with and and just hand it to me um, without any, any mention of the other writer is indicative of a, a mindset that says, yeah, AI, whatever they whatever it is that they can do to. Uh, to get free content is um, is is very much on the table. Um, I mean, another big part of it is, you know, this this like, this notion of, you know, the, the one step deal that a writer gets paid when you start a movie and then you get paid when you finish a movie. And the uh, uh, the abuse of that is that you you start a movie. The basically supposed to, the idea is supposed to be you start writing it and then twelve weeks later you turn it in and you get the second check. And both of those checks, that's your fee. Um, but what happens is you turn in that set, you know, you turn in your draft after 12 weeks and they say, hey, we have some notes and we'll pay you, but, you know, we want you to do the notes first. And you do the notes and you do the notes and you do the notes and they find that it's basically nine months <laughs> between first check and second check. And I oh. was working on a project where it was two years between the first check and the second check, um, which means that, you know, you think you've made this, you know, oh, great, I'm just going to be a million bucks or it's going to be a half million bucks or whatever it is. And you wind up having to live for five years on it. Um, suddenly, it's not as much as you think <laughs> as you think it is. And you're always living with this uncertainty of, uh, am I ever going to get paid? Um, and that's, you know, it, it's it's incredibly abusive. And, and they... They, they just do it without even thinking about it. So um, so that's on the bargaining table, too? How writers yes. get paid? Yes. Okay. Yes. Well, okay. One, one great idea, and I hope it survives, I really hope it survives, is the idea of you get your start payment, and then immediately after, uh, you know, say you're going to write for 12 weeks, you get a check every week for those 12 weeks. Um, you know, you, you're, you're finish, your, your, um, your end payment is divided into 12 weeks, uh, 12 week increments. Um, mm. And then if it goes longer than that, fine, you know, you negotiate and then you continue to pay the writer for the, for the additional weeks. The other thing that I, I like that everybody's talking about is the end of the one step deal and going back to what we had, which was two, three step deals. You know, it used to be that you would, you would write a draft, um, you'd write a draft, you'd finish it, they'd take a look at it and they'd say, hey, we want you to, we have some notes and then you'd write a second draft. And that second draft was basically half the payment of the first draft. And you'd get maybe half the time or whatever, you know, but you were, you had a relationship with the producer, off you go. And, um, and uh, after that, then they'd say, okay, great. We're in much better shape. We have a couple of tweaks and stuff. And then you would do a polish and the polish was for, you know, uh, uh, a couple of weeks was basically half again, 
you know, the start payment, the second draft, and the third, you know, would be half again. And uh, But you would be paid every step along the way. And the, the fun of it was, of course, you'd get your finish payment and your start payment for things, and you could enjoy life you know, right. a little bit. And now it's just like, oh, God, it's five years. I need to get something else going. They're giving me notes every day. Uh, I'm going to have to, you know, mortgage. I'm going to have to put, take a second out Aww. on the house just to survive. I'm hoping, you know, that they'll do it. And then finally they say, oh, well, we're, no, we're, we're not happy with this. We're going to settle for a half, you know, for 50 cents on the dollar or whatever it is, however they try to get out of it. Um, and you're, you're, you know, you're generally screwed by the time you turn the thing in. And at the very least, there's just bad blood. And then they bring in something mm-hmm. cheap, you know, to, to rewrite you. So um, uh, all of these things have kind of just been come, become – standard uh unbearable writer <laughs> yeah right. well, when, when it's, it's the boiling of the frog right you know it's the <laughs> uh, um it, it's that that gradually you know okay well we'll put up with it we'll put up with it and, and and then and then it just becomes like everybody you know two or three writers start talking and they say wow me too you know that's, <laughs> that happened mm. to me this is terrible and we need to do something about it because it's happening even to upper echelon writers and uh if it's happening to the upper echelon writers then it's absolutely happening to the the writers downstream uh and Mm -hmm. that's when the strike becomes really important so yeah thank you for clarifying that i think uh some of these issues that you've brought up i think that most people are not aware of and uh if there's anything else you think about that's included in the strike feel free to jump in at any time um i know those are the major issues and you know we're all supporting you uh let's let's jump to your career yeah which is what what i I should say is one of the best things that happens as you walk in the picket line is everybody goes by and they beat their horns and there's a whole lot of support like yay you know you guys keep fighting (laughs) And, and what I've been hearing from executives is how annoying all of the honking is when you're in the offices. You know? <laughs> so all of the people in the studio are like, oh, there's writers every day. There's this honking constantly. So keep honking, keep supporting, keep, uh, you know, uh, we'll get through this. Yes, we will get through this. We will. And I'm going to meet you out there on the picket line. You are a titan in the industry. And what fascinates me about reading your bio is how you jump from live action to animation that you don't you you have you have so many skills. How I mean, how'd you do that? Most people don't do that. Right. Right. Yeah. It. I'm, I'm amazed at the amount of uh, sitcom writers who haven't been able to make the transition into live action. Live action writers who can't make the transition into animation, they're all very, very different things. And I always, uh, um, I always say, you know, uh, 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 adapt and survive, uh, um, stagnate and die. You know, that, <laughs> that, that with every new thing, you really have to take it as, um, as okay, this is new. I probably can't take my skill set from the previous thing into this. I shouldn't try to write movies like they're sitcoms. I should just take it that I love movies, I, I have a certain point of view, and um, and I'm going to try to write the best movie that I can, as opposed to, you know, uh, I'm just going to take my, my thing that I learned on Fresh Prince and make Fresh Prince movies. You can't do that. Mm-hmm. You simply can't, especially if it's animation. Animation is its own world. So when you get into it, you really have to kind of look at it and say, uh, okay, well, what, you know, I'm a baby in this new world, you know, mm-hmm. and uh, I'm, I'm a vessel. I'm just going to take in all the new information that I can. Um, I'm going to learn as quickly as I can and uh, apply everything that I can as quickly as I can. There are fundamentals of storytelling that, that, that take place in all worlds. And I think that's probably been, if anything, my advantage is that when I was in TV, when I was in sitcoms especially, I um, I was always a story guy. I was always looking for like, okay, well, what is this about really? And and, and can we, even on a, uh, like Full House, right? You know, I was a guy who wrote the last five minutes of every episode of Full House, you know, where it's like, <laughs> oh, we're so, we're so sorry, you know, whatever. Oh, well, you know, cheaters never prosper. You know, whatever that thing was, <laughs> the meaning, the theme, that was, the moral. Uh, that was me. Yeah, exactly, mm-hmm. the moral of it. And then, 
in hours, you know, the same kind of thing, finding the, the way through it. Um, uh, also in, in, in live action, you know, just trying to find like, what is this about? Even if it's an action movie, what is it really, what is the heart of it all? And, um, and then just taking that into animation where it's very, very important. Like, you know, they're always saying, you know, where are you in this? You know, how is this? It's a big corporate thing, I know, and they make uh, you know five hundred million dollars a movie. But but really, what you're doing is you're trying to tell a very personal story. That the mm-hmm. way to five hundred million dollars is to connect, you know, very closely emotionally with your audience. Uh, if you can do that, then you're fine. If you if you're just making what everybody else makes, then you know you, 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 it's going to fall apart. Um, one thing I learned that I love is this notion in all art of heart, head, and hand. You know, this notion of, of like that heart is what you bring to it is what we were just talking about. It's like the, your love of it and you know, how it's a personal story. Head is the new idea. Is there something new? For, you know, uh, Princess and the Frog was a very unorthodox telling of a princess story. Um, and, and then hand is the craftsmanship. You know, is it a well-told story? Is it tight? Are the jokes funny? All of that stuff. And if you can combine those you're you're well off no matter what you're doing if you're painting if you're making music if you're you know acting directing you you know you're 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 well off if you're not then if it doesn't have heart it's going to be dry if it doesn't have um um hand it's going to be poorly made you know if it doesn't have um a head it's going to be a bad idea or it's going to be a retread of somebody else's old idea and you know so so long as you can kind of do those things and take those things with you in your sack uh, of, of of tricks and then adapt really kind of just like say you know open yourself up and say i'm gonna be vulnerable i'm gonna be i'm i'm uh, you know i'm i'm gonna feel really really stupid uh for a long time uh but when it's done i will be i will be great and so you know embrace the suck <laughs> you know and then and then, and then move on and, and uh, adapt and survive so yeah I love that. I don't know if you know that I was teaching acting in the animation studios. Wow. I was teaching at DreamWorks for an extended amount of time in Warner Animation Group. And I created uh, method boarding. So method acting nice. for animators. And so we probably know a lot of people in common. I know we're both oh, friends sure. with John, both friends with John Musker on Facebook. Uh, oh, yeah. So, so I worked, you know, really closely with with people from all over uh, the company and different jobs. And you know, we talked about the morality issue and tried to humanize the stories with how they had experienced it and to put pieces of themselves in it. And we also worked on micro moments, these little moments frame by frame, you know, what's happening and how they take your words and how they uh, put it into a person. And we literally would go micro moment through micro moment in the script. But one thing we talked about was that, or I talked about was that these are like the old fashioned morality plays that you read about at the turn of the century. You know, we're learning a lesson. It's to better society, to better all the children watching and adults. And so the fact that you brought that up um, is, is so interesting to me. Um, I want to talk about, oh my gosh, there's so much. Well, well, first of all, wait, 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 don't don't move on from there because that that becomes really important. Because what I one of the things I love about your show is how you are, uh, uh, you know, teaching even now uh, to actors who, who who may be watching and stuff. And 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 one thing that I I, I notice as a as an animation writer as as it is, um, and even with with sitcoms is that you know you're using the same tools as a writer and as an actor, uh, you know, which is why like guys like you know Matt Damon are such great writers and, and Emma Thompson and whatever you know. They won time and they win Academy Awards. Um, the um, it, it's the same kind of toolbox and uh, mm-hmm. and what you want as a as a writer writing frogs in the bayou is for people like Anika Noni Rose to just embrace it and say I don't care if I'm a frog I'm, a, I'm you know I'm I'm this uh, I'm this really you know badass woman and I, you know <laughs> I just happen to look like a frog for now and and off you go and she creates this character that is just wonderfully. Um, you know, strong and intelligent and, and, and everything, even though, 
she's a frog. She doesn't do the thing of like, oh, I'm a frog now, so I gotta like you know play it like it's a cartoon. She plays right. an actual character and brings strength to the to the role, which is what I was hoping. As I'm writing it, I'm trying to write the strongest character that I can, and I was so gl- glad that she um, took it and ran with it and inspired me. And so when I go back to rewrite it, I'm writing. Okay, good. I can I can write her even stronger because she's she's so sweet. You know, on top of it that I can play, I can nuance the character a little bit. Um, you know, same with like guys like Keith David and, you know, um, uh, Jim Cummings, who were who were just amazing all over that movie. Um, it is always it is always super fun. So, yeah, as you talk about the method part of it, yes, you have mm-hmm. to kind of you're playing a character and you want that character to uh, to resonate, to 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 move the emotions of, of people in the audience. And, you know, but there is. I don't know if it's a crutch or a helper, but that, that, that it's animated, you know, you're going through these drawings or these, you know, whatever the computer thing, you know, there is a barrier between you and the audience. You know, you're not able to just kind of use your, use your instrument and, and, and perform. You are performing through an, uh, through an animator. So you have to in, inspire the animator. I mean, the animator has to kind of go on and, and do the rest of it. So to be able to kind of, you know, with voice inflection and energy and all of that kind of fun stuff that that actors can bring to it, on top of the the um, you know hard head and hand once again, you know that, yeah. that on top of all of that to 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 bring you know your yourself into it, lighten it up so that it's 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 fun to animate and then uh, you know and that you're bringing those moments that are so clear that the animator can say oh I know exactly what this is. Um, and then, yeah, the audience sits down, they cry their eyes out or they laugh, you know, they, 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 they laugh and cry and they, they want to see it again. And that's what that is. Yeah, it's wonderful. I love that. So you're essentially connected to that actor, especially once you see what they're going to bring to it. It gives you permission to go deeper. You know, there's an expression that my my acting teacher, a very famous man named Jeffrey Horn, uh, said that as as far as you go out, as deep as you need to go in. Yeah. And Absolutely. so I, I, you know, I really would like to do more training with animators. I think it's important. I think it's important for them to understand the acting process of it as well. And I was surprised when I started teaching that, you know, they'd had very little of that. They'd had some improv, but um, the method work, you know, really could be spread out. And it is, I am spreading it out all over the world into different forms of communication because it's authentically using yourself. Uh, well, you've worked to, I mean, the, the old the old school animators used to have big mirrors right next to their tables and they or would act ro- into the mirror and, mm-hmm. then, and then draw. Yeah. Or rotoscope. They'd have actual yes. actors. Yes. And uh, some people still use actual actors. And I've seen photos of the Disney uh, actors coming in and the animators drawing them. And of course, I started teaching in animation because I was a uh, animation model at all these studios yeah, before that. So I've really been in all aspects of animation. So it fascinates me that you've had such success in animation. You began, you know, your early your early career, uh, Full House Rock, The Parenthood, Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, um, in living color, I love that show. And uh, so, like, what's what's your cup of tea now? I mean, you can do it all. So, what do you want to be doing right now? Right. Well, it's 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 fun because I I now look for in the hard head and hand of it all. Like, I, I feel like I can basically take anything, and I, I'm no I'm no longer sitting there trying to figure out how to do things. When somebody approaches me with an idea, I know I have three or four different, you know, maybe more approaches that I can take with it, and um, and I'm now pretty I'm pretty confident in my skill set now, so so I know that I can do a, a, a decent job of it. What's fun is I'm sure everybody's lives were um, you know were impacted uh, you know uh, uh, with uh, with quarantine, and um, for me for ri- writers in general our lives didn't change <laughs> that much because it's something that you do in your house. And, uh, you know, um, and so the, the idea of not having to go out was actually, uh, uh an improvement, um, you know, because every writer has to deal with like, oh, okay, I'm going to Warner brothers today. It's going to be a 45 minute drive. And then I'm going to have to park my car. And, 
and they're going to give me a terrible parking spot. It's going to be 15 minutes away <laughs> from the from the thing. They're going to give me that tiny water. I'm going to have to wait half hour for the meeting. The meeting's going to last a half hour, and then I'm going to have to do the whole schlep all the way home. Um, the idea of writing, click, meeting, click, writing is is just amazing. So uh, three things came up for me. One was uh, a project from Marvel, which um, I can't talk about, but it was wonderful. And those guys are freaking geniuses. Very, very fun to work on. Um, uh, Aflac called me uh, to do a short film. So I did a short film for them called The Park Bench. And uh, it's only three and a half minutes long. You can find it. It's on, uh, what is it? It's on Apple and it's on um, Amazon. Uh, and it's also free if you just go to YouTube and search uh, Aflac, uh, The Park Bench. And, um, uh, and that wound up being just a, a ton of fun. It was, it was a, a great way to kind of stretch, uh, stretch myself and, and, and see what I could do. Uh, uh, that wound up winning a bunch of awards and was in um, Oscar contention. Uh, towards the end of the year i think that because it was aflac presents i think that really hurt us uh but um but the aflac guys couldn't have been more supportive and could have been more wonderful and and it was just a, a great thing to work with i love the guys that i worked with on that uh, so that was fun uh there's this project called sneaks uh, that i wrote and directed that uh that, that you know is working its way through we'll see what happens there and then um this high school buddy of mine called me up and said, uh, you know, hey, have you ever heard of Captain Robert Smalls? I said, no, Google, like, why don't I know this guy, <laughs> you know? And uh, it's a uh, Civil War, um, Civil War hero, guy was born a slave, uh, was, uh, during the war, was kind of uh, forced to work on a uh, ship that basically just um, took munitions from one place to the other. Uh, when the, when the uh, crew, the white crew kind of left one night, he commandeered the boat and the nine families, you know, the nine families that of all the crew members joined them in the middle of Charleston Bay. And uh, <clears throat> and they took the boat, got through five checkpoints in, uh, in the harbor, five military checkpoints. So he had memorized all the stuff, dressed as the captain with his glove, his coat and his hat, acted, you know, did his mannerisms as he was kind of like, you know, singling these things, wow. surrendered the boat full of munitions to the Union was an instant war hero. Uh, after that, sailed 17 missions uh, uh, with that boat. They made him the captain of that ship. He eventually ran for Congress, um, I believe five times, one, you know, uh, was the longest serving uh, congressman at the time. Uh, started a railroad, started a newspaper, bought the house that he was enslaved in. And, uh, and Unbelievable. the wife of the owner um, who by, at that point was, uh, uh, you know, believe, we believe was suffering from dementia and uh, returned to the house. It was just kind of like disheveled, returned to the house, poor, you know, because, you know, whatever, the, the, the union had taken everybody's money. Um, they, they welcomed her back in, let her, leave, you know, let her live out her days in the, in the bedroom that she had had before uh, and shared the house with them. Um, and then died at the ripe old age. I believe, you know, the biggest thing he ever did was die of natural causes. Um, but, uh, you know, he died at 75 and was, for most of his life, the most famous black man in, in the world. We know nothing about it. And so they approached me with this movie. I was like, yes, I'd like to do this movie. <laughs> let's, let's go. And so now we're, because in the world that we live in now with, uh, with the streamers and everything, everything is based on IP. So we're doing a um, a graphic novel, series of graphic novels uh, to to launch it. We're doing tell um, um, t-shirts and all kinds of stuff. We're going to be at Comic Con. We've got an all-star cast of uh, of artists uh, uh, doing the doing the books. Um, it's just it's it's just a, a ton of fun. So that's my you know um uh while sitting at home <laughs> you know <laughs> i i tend to be lucky in that way where where uh, you know a lot a lot of times the projects that i really really want to do just kind of show up on my doorstep and so it's you know what is it luck luck is um preparation meets opportunity so yes. uh yeah so so you know people call and they're like hey could you do this and now is a perfect time because I'm not nervous about it um, and thinking like, oh, no, I'm going to louse it up. You should give it to somebody else. I'm thinking, oh, boy, you know, 
perfect time. You know, I can't wait mm-hmm. to slam, you know, to just hit this thing out of the park. So uh, I, I'm really excited. So you really earned that confidence to be where you are now. And yeah, I think so. I think cockiness when you're 20, but, you know, like <laughs> confidence when you're <laughs> when you get older. So, Good. Yeah. I love that. You know, there are a lot of people listening who want to write and act. And Mm -hmm. we live in a world where we have access to doing things like this. We can create our own, you know, projects. So do you have any advice for actors listening today? Yeah. Oh, great. On anything. I think that, Mm. well, I think that it is, um, I think, well, it's interesting because when I, you know, I'll, I'll age myself that no, my first movies were like Super 8, you know, whatever, just me, three minutes and whatever, trying to shoot stuff in my high school. Uh, and then um, and then video was best or 16 millimeter and it would just cost so much. If you were going to make a three minute film, it would cost you like twenty thousand dollars or so, um, you know, to put the sound on and do pr- prints and that, and that kind of thing. And now you can basically just pick up your phone and point it at something and, 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 and go. So the there are no real limitations. Everybody has software, you know, the script writing software, um, or at the very least a, um, you know, something that you can do on your laptop uh, that, 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 you know, that looks like a script. Uh, you don't need a, you know, IBM Selectric, you know, typewriter and uh, the ability to type or anything like that. You can just go. So um, that's the upside. The downside is everybody has those tools now. So the so the game gets a lot, of, a lot harder. You have to do a lot more to kind of stand out. Um, and but I will see a lot of people out on in the Internet kind of doing fantastic things you know really funny things short clips of them being funny really great acting clips you know um and uh the one thing that that cracks me up that 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 happens a lot is every so often somebody will do like a a princess and the frog parody and um and the you know they know something that nobody else knows which is when you do that it gets forwarded to everybody who worked on the movie you know, Aww. absolutely everybody who works on the movie is going to look at the parody uh, and they're going to see what it is you do. You know, I remember when um, when that uh, 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 fan fiction um, uh, Princess and the Frog, uh, uh, not Princess and the Frog, but uh, 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 Fresh Prince of Bel-Air uh, thing uh, came out. The guy just made a trailer, you know, whatever. And of course it gets to Will because it had gotten to me, it gotten to, you know, uh, Andy and Susan Borowitz. Everybody who worked on the show was talking about like, oh, hey, have you seen that that trailer for Fresh Prince of Bel-Air? That looks hilarious. And of course, you know, next thing you know, Will is producing it and it's on the air. And uh, what is it? Unbelievable. Is third season. So out of nowhere, you know, if you want it to happen, it can it can happen. But you have to have the idea. You know, you have to execute it well and you have to have you know, and you have to bring something of yourself to it. Uh, you can't you can't just show up. You know, you can't just say like, oh, I'm great. So off we go. You know, you can't show up unprepared. Like I say, you know, opportunity is um, uh, or, or luck is preparation meets opportunity. So many people get the opportunity and they're unprepared for what's going to happen. And um even with me, like I've, I've cast a lot of my friends in, in, uh, in my stuff and I'm often, you know, the, the terrible conversation you have to have when you, when you have to go to your friend and say like, Oh, we're, we're going to have to cut you out of the show <laughs> or we're going to have to, you know, uh, 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 you know, everybody, I, I fought, I fought to the last, but I can't, you know, we're going to have to recast you. Um, because that person is, it be- is just not they weren't prepared. Yeah. And when you say not prepared, do you mean with choices? Do you mean knowing their lines? What do you mean? Choices. Choices, confidence, you know, the, the same things that make you, uh, that you, if you take to any, any endeavor, if you go in timid, if, if you, if your job is to, uh, you know, here's the star of the show, and your job is to be the uh, the waitress who is going to, um, you know, be snarky with the, the star, right? That's everybody's first role. Um, uh, and you are timid in doing that. If you're kind of like you're, 
you give up frame to the to to the star and you're not as snarky and you don't you don't take the stage and do your do your thing then immediately it nothing works because you have to be ironclad in order to to play that part and so um uh it's not funny the other way if you're you know uh you know uh, would you like uh, you know frog legs you can't you have to if if the fear shows then, then it's it's simply not going to work, and you're better off just uh, recasting because you're not going to get that performance out of that actor. Um, you know, somebody else will come in and bam, kill it. You know, and 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 it always cracks me up that that so many actors, and I wish more actors knew this. So here you go. But so many yeah. actors will look at you know the first part that they play, and they'll just hate it. You know, <laughs> Sean Penn. You know, Sean Penn hates, you know, uh, Fast Times at Ridgemont High. You know, um, uh, Dustin Hoffman hates his Volkswagen bug commercials. You know, uh, Tom Hank, uh, Tom Cruise, uh, you know, uh, 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 looks at his first couple of parts, including Risky Business, and says, like, oh, why did I do that thing? But they did them, and they committed to them, and they were great in them, and that's what, that's what sends a signal out to Hollywood to say, like, okay, well, this person... That is a, you know, um, Keanu Reeves, right? You know, <laughs> you know, that for the longest time he looked at Bill and Ted's and said, why did I do that thing? Well, the reason why you did it is because you were killed it. You know, you, you uh, were absolutely amazing. You were so joyful and wonderful. And, and everybody could tell that there was a much better, that the actor was much bigger than the part. And um, and and that that guy needed to have a gun in his hand, and, you know, whatever, and needed to be, you know, whatever, and his dog needed to die, and he needed to kind of like go through, you know, whatever, and he needed to be a huge, huge, huge action star, um, and and uh, and that's what happens. But I think a lot of actors will go into those parts, look at it, and say like, oh, this is beneath me, and they won't commit to them. Mm. And uh, in doing so, now now it's a bad actor in a bad part. As opposed to like, oh, did you wait? Wait, look at the back. Look at that guy in the back. You know, um, he freeze frame it. Just, just watch what that that actor is doing while this other guy is doing stuff. That guy is super present there. You know, whatever. He may be in alien costume or whatever, but this guy is killing it. Um, you know, let's get that guy on the phone because we can really use him for this other thing. You know, that's what happens. That's what happens in the cast. Does movies, it? Is, does that yes, really happen? Absolutely. That really happens. I can't tell you how many times somebody has sent me. Okay, I'll tell you when uh, I created a show called Out All Night with Patty Labelle, uh, 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 Morris Chestnut, and uh, uh, Dwayne Martin, and uh, uh, Vivica Fox. All three of them were terrible auditions. <laughs> they were terrible. They came in and just stunk the place up. Uh, Morris Chestnut, um, he he was terrible because he thought he wasn't funny, so he just played everything. Like, why am I here? And then I saw him on the Rock, MTV Rock and Jock basketball game. He won the MVP, and he, and he was clowning around afterwards, and he was just phenomenal. He was just very present and wonderful, and I'd known his other work. So I said, wow, if he could be that funny there, let's just call him up at home and say, like, dude, you know, you screwed your audition, but I want to have you back in, and I want you to just relax, and I'm going to give you a million takes to, to do it because I think you can do it if you do it. You know, if you commit to it, I think you can get there. That's one. Two, Dwayne Martin came in. He had a flu when he auditioned, but he was powering through his audition. And I could tell that through the flu, his comic timing was so great, was so on point that um, that healthy, he would be fantastic. You know, he would just be ready to go. Vivica Fox was a, um, uh, you know, had, had been doing uh, uh, soap operas. And she was really great on soap operas, but uh, I didn't know if she had any timing. And and that category, the ingenue, is a huge category. You know, whatever uh, twenty two year old right. actresses who can uh, you know who who can do stuff. Uh, but she came in, and um, and I think she just had this attitude of because she was playing, um, yeah, she was playing uh, 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 DJ Jazzy Jeff's sister on Fresh Prince, and she came in and just like. I'm just going to have a good time. <laughs> you know, you guys are at my party and, and, and off I go. I have my skill set and I'm just going to, you know, I may not be the funniest. Per I'm not a stand up comic, but I have some timing and I have a life to me and, you know, and off I go. And everybody else came in like, oh, I'm pretty. I'm just going to be my thing, whatever, pretty. And she was like, I'm the fun girl who whatever who you want to hang out with. And it was like, 
that is exactly around the way girl so um so i cast her we cast her in that i cast her in another pilot that i did with uh, don Cheadle, and she was fantastic in that and then we uh had her again on out all night um and in that case i just said hey do you want to do this i'm not going to audition anybody else for this uh take the part you know uh, i love writing for you i love the commitment that you have to the the stuff um you know my words fit very well into your uh, instrument so um you know please do it and uh and off she went and it was no surprise to me when she was doing quentin tarantino movies and all kinds of stuff and uh you know uh, after the fact and uh what was it uh, you know uh independence day that uh that that she was she was ready for bigger things and uh you know and it was just fun to have uh, you know three of them plus patty labelle of course uh, mm-hmm. uh to myself for a season so you know, oh that wonderful was, that was yeah. it yeah I didn't realize you had such a huge say in the casting process. I mean, is that, do you have to be in conjunction with the director on that? In TV, in movies, absolutely. In mm-hmm. TV, no. In mm. TV, if you're a producer, executive producer, co-exec producer, you know, supervising producer, um, in that case, I created the show. Um, uh, Andy Borowitz, Susan Borowitz, and myself, we had the entire say. So we would... We would consult with each other. Um, a lot of times, though, they would they were great because, I, as you can tell, I'm fairly passionate about stuff, you know. And fairly. I, <laughs> fairly, just a little bit, you know, a tiny bit. But, um, but, but one thing that I like that, that uh, you know, when I feel it, I feel it. I'm like, oh, this is great, you know. Um, mm. and, uh, uh, and I will see an actor's performance and just start writing. I'm like, oh, I know this. This is going to go great, and this is going to go great. We can do this with them, you know, whatever. They'll react really well to these kind of things. You know, if you can cry funny or if you, you know, whatever, if you dance funny and anything like that, it's like, okay, great. I know exactly what I'm going to do. And it's a sitcom format. Um, same is true with uh, with animation. You know, you get um, – when I heard Anika Noni Rose's voice the first time, and she was auditioning against everybody. You know, if yeah. you can imagine a list of – People who sing that are famous, um, all of them auditioned for Tiana, all of them, and they were all fantastic. And then, mm. and then Anika came in, and at the time it was like you know Anika is fantastic, she's great, but but you just see her name on the on the list and you're like oh okay well yeah Anika, and it's all blind you know you're not seeing anybody whatever it's just a somebody comes in and they have a um, you know, they have audio files and they say, hey, Rob, you know, click through these and, and tell me what you think. And you hear her and music, you know, it's just like, oh, yeah. this is exactly the voice. You know, she's she's so strong in what, you know, all the things I gave, I attributed to her before is strong and she has this great thing. And immediately her, you know, she just jumps out ahead of everybody else. And uh, And I went to the directors and I said, I have to write for her. You know that she is yeah. that 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 it wow. is it is an uh, uh, an enormously better movie if I can write to that particular voice because I don't want her to come off as harsh. I want her to be a princess, but I want her to be a modern princess. I want her to be smart and strong. Um, and so people who came in and they were just strong, like oh no, and people aren't going to like her. And people who came in that were just sweet, it was like, oh, she's going to, you know, everybody's going to say like, oh, she's just being given stuff. And I wanted her to fight through it. I wanted, you know, I knew that the movie was going to be about hard work and, and um, you know, and that she was going to be a very modern, very independent uh, uh, woman. And, uh, but she had to be a princess underneath it all. And Anika's voice was just like, oh, you know, butter. So, um um, yeah, and then I just advocated very strongly, and they said, eh, you know, we were we were actually on the same page. <laughs> you know, we were, we were about to make the same decision, and thank you. Thank you for that. The Prince was harder to cast, very much harder to cast. Uh, yeah. But um, um, uh, there were a couple of guys who were, who were just really, really good, and that was just kind of like not a coin toss, but really just longer conversations. It took maybe a week. To make the decision, you know, just listening back and forth to uh, to various tapes. Um, but yeah, the writer in TV is king, um, you know, for all that's worth. 
that you and it's worth a lot you're going to yeah you're going to hand the your, your words to somebody that person either needs to be able to do that joke or not if they cannot it's going to make the writing look bad and then and your mm-hmm. job is on the line if they can and they plus it they can do a little extra thing with the with the joke then everybody's going to turn to you and go oh you are a genius you know, and you're going to go, oh, wow, another Emmy nomination for Rob Edwards. You know, um, <laughs> yeah, and that, and that is, that's, that's how that happens. So you protect yourself, but also you're kind of like game loves game. And, you, and you're mm-hmm. looking for the best, uh, you know, the best um, vehicle for your, for your material. Love that. I've had some sitcom directors on here discussing rhythm and comedy and how mm. important it is if that's what you want to do. Um. Do you feel that actors, I'm going to, I'll keep you for just three more questions. Do you feel mm-hmm. that actors should pursue voiceover? Because I know for me, I never did because I felt like, okay, you know what? There's only so much I can focus on and I want to focus really well on what I want to do, which I knew was on camera acting. I wonder if you feel there, an actor should have a voiceover reel so they can work in any genre. Oh, wow. Yeah. That is, it, it's interesting because I, I will nuance the question, unfortunately, for you. Because I have, uh, uh, and I will, I'll get myself in trouble also. That, that if you watch, <laughs> um, what is it, Prince of Egypt, right? It's, it's Brad Pitt mm-hmm. and, um, and uh, uh, I think it's, I forget who the other actor is. I'm sorry. But two big, two big actors. Mm-hmm. And Brad Pitt is a fantastic physical actor, not a great voice actor. Um, I'm just gonna say it. I'm in trouble. Mm, but okay. you know, yeah. but he. Okay. But there are guys Brad's who be are okay. better. There are guys who are better at it. You know, than, than mm-hmm. I'm sure he would. He would. He would be the first to admit it. And he hasn't done a lot of other uh, uh, voice acting. He's a fantastic. He's one of our greatest actors in body. But you know, just part of what he does, which is the cool. The, the 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 kind of the simmer under the thing and acting with his eyes and acting in the way he eats a hot dog and stuff like that, all of that <laughs> stuff doesn't doesn't come through in the way uh, in a voice actor. Um, uh, and I'll say it's very similar to what I was saying before with like writing movies, writing um, writing TV shows, writing dramatic TV shows, writing. Uh, uh, live action films and writing animated films that they're very diff- very different things that mm-hmm. um, if you take on voice acting um, you have to uh, divorce yourself from a lot of the things that you do well as a physical actor um, you know you're always going to be looking for um, those lilts you know that little energy uh, and stuff as I was working on Sneaks you know I'm working with um uh, you know Martin Lawrence, who's done a ton of animation. Uh, he's in it, and and um, uh, Anthony Mackie, who is a fantastic physical actor. But you know, and, and Mackie, very similar to to Brad Pitt, was kind of like, well, wait, what should I do? And I'm like, you got, you know, give me the levels, give me the, you know, uh, you know, go. And Mackie, I knew he could do it because he's been so great in, uh, you know, like like uh, like Morris Chestnut. He was so great in interviews. He's so, so funny that I knew that he would be just, there was this comedian kind of waiting to kind of jump out. And so we got him out in, uh, you know, with sneaks. So he's, he's phenomenal. He is absolutely phenomenal. And then other people like, you know, Macy Gray came in and, um, and uh, you know, a bunch of other people. And each one of them, you have to remind them that you're not just saying the lines. You have to physicalize your voice. If that makes sense, you know, you know, there's a difference between good morning and good morning, you know, you know, how you doing? You know, whatever. I remember there was this kid came in on Treasure Planet and they were apologizing because he had a uh, he had a cold and uh, he would sniff between lines and at everything. And, and his father kept apologizing. And I said, that is gold. You know, I'm sitting there with the animator and I, and I said, I said, it is now an elephant and the elephant has a large nose. And every time he sneezes, you know, every time he sneezes, the thing contracts and whatever. And he's like, oh, what? and he starts drawing and I'm, I start rewriting and I'm like, I'm like, OK, say this. And I'm, I'm trying to find words with B's and M's, you know, whatever. So that so that it really, I, I really think that whatever, all of that stuff. And it was like, oh, 
mm, comedy gold in just that he had that that there was something new. You know, if you have you know, look at the classic guys like you know Sterling Sillivan, who were like, so say how are you so you know, and they could do these little things with their voice or like you know, but 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 do 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 you think that you know, and you get those things that is animatable. Um, and, you know, if you're just acting, not, you know, so you have to find some energy. It's, it's the theatricality to it. Um, uh, nuance because you're doing your work underneath all of the, all of the other fun stuff and, uh, uh, and just go with it, you know, but, but a lot of actors, they won't put away their other, other thing and they'll go. So I say, yes, if you can, if you can separate yourself as a voice performer from yourself as a as a physical actor by all means please come we could use we could use new voices we're always especially the black community we're looking for like nuanced black voices if you have a crazy accent please bring it to animation you know it's always people with new york accents and uh, southern accents and stuff like that that um um that that get those parts because animators like to have fun um mm. Yeah, so that would be my that would be my yeah. answer. Yeah. Oh, Please so come good in, to you know, me. come jump in the pool but but bring something to the to the party. Excellent advice. Excellent advice. I have so many talented black actors that, you know, I want to pass this on to that can do wonderful character work. And you know, it like right now in my acting class we're doing all Tennessee Williams. And yeah. uh do, do you know the Seven Descents of Myrtle? Uh, no. to, I don't know if you know this. Okay, okay. so it, 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 I have an nice. actor. I'm going to call him. I'm going to call him out right now, James Adams, because I know you listen to my podcast. Who's doing the, <laughs> nice. who's doing the role of chicken? And you Where know, I love, I love doing. Yes, James, we're going to get your headshot to Rob. Um, I love doing character work. I think class is the place to dig in and do those roles that you won't necessarily do. And so yeah. with the Strasbourg work, we have all sorts of exercises, painting exercises and animal exercises that, you know, really help us to develop character. But of course, we're yes. always inside out, but I'm right. I'm right there with you that you can be so much more and you can create so much from yourself. But I appreciate that. I really appreciate that story, and I'm definitely going to share it. Well, obviously, everyone's going to hear it on this podcast, yes. but no, I'm going to pass it on. I'm going to pass it on. Uh, well, I didn't get to every single question, um, but, I, I, you I'll know, you I do. One. I'll give you one more, and I'll answer it quickly, because I know we're coming okay. up on uh, Okay. Uh, what, what's your favorite sketch that you worked on in Living Color? Ooh. Um. It was, uh, 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 and, and it'll date the first season of the show it's okay. and, uh, and everything. The, um, um, <laughs> Robin Gibbons and Mike Tyson were going through this really uh, crazy, uh, crazy divorce in, in full yeah, public view. And, uh, and they had done a bunch of interviews, I think with, um, I, I forget who it was, but, uh, you know, but, but. Where, where they were talking about like you know that, that Tyson was on you know he was on uh, uh, mood enhancing drugs and stuff like that and that Robin Givens was doing all kinds of, and it was just crazy that every day we were kind of watching you know this this big hero kind of go through this thing and uh, and somebody said I think we were watching it on TV and then we turned the channel and Love Connection was on you know because really <laughs> when you're comedy writing all you're doing all day is just watching tv you know whatever and so uh so love connection comes on and and uh and we go like hey robin gibbons mike tyson on love connection and and then it was just like boom you know everything kind of just we just went crazy um there's another one that i love that didn't make it on air but that made it on in a, in a different way which is I wanted to do the 1935 uh, Academy Awards um, and the black portrayals, you know, Step and Fetch It and, uh, you know, Mantan Moreland and some of the, you know, and uh, Hattie McDaniel and some of the, you know, some of the characters that were just doing these really embarrassing, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, racial stereotypes and and just show it as like, OK, this is where we were in movies and, and uh, you know, not too long ago. Um, it didn't survive, I think, because people had to know both sides of it. You know, you had to kind of know what was going on now, and you had to kind of, you know, be aware of 1935 movies. You know, who knows who Mantan Moreland is and more Step and Fetch it. 
So, um, but that was one of my favorites. And uh, and one thing that it did was I think it it led to this moment in Black History and um, and a lot of the other things that we were doing. If you look at the first season, the first the pilot. A lot of what happened in all the rest of the seasons was in that pilot. So we were just mm. we were just jamming. We were it was a really great writing staff, and we had some fantastic ideas. And uh, um, uh, I wish we had won the uh, uh, won the um, the Emmy that year. Uh, but uh, me we too, lost to Crystal. But, <laughs> but <laughs> he's um, pretty good. But it was he was great, and he it was it was a fantastic comedy special that he'd done. So he well well deserved. But. For, but um, um, you know, you always look back at the at the the one you didn't uh, the one you didn't win. But um, but yeah, a super super fun experience uh, uh, doing it. I uh, it sharpens sharpened my sense of humor. So it's all stuff that I use all the way throughout uh, everything else I do. Yeah, it's really impressive everything that you've done. And you were at the beginning of Will Smith's career, and yeah. you know it's. It's just incredible, Rob, what you've achieved. All right, we're all going to want to know where we can follow you, find you, get in contact with you. Do you want to share any of your socials oh, sure. or anything? I'm 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 easy. I'm the easiest person in the world to get in touch with. <laughs> you know, I'm on all socials as uh, I am Rob Edwards. So uh, you can always find me. Um, um, and I try to answer everything. So, uh, yeah, so reach out, you know, uh, uh, James, I'm waiting for you. <laughs> send, me, <laughs> send me your stuff. Let me see. Let me see what you got. So, uh, yeah, yeah. Great. I'm, I'm wide open. I'm always looking. Thank you, Rob, for that inspirational conversation. You have so much wisdom, and we thank you for your generosity. Let's be sure to connect with Rob and watch all of these wonderful films and television shows that he's worked on, and we can't wait to see what you do next. If you'd like to hear more of these podcasts, be sure to visit my website at diaryofanactress.com. We're on audio, we're on YouTube, and we just love to have you as a subscriber. Until the next time, stay inspired.